So hello, Dr. Parsa. Welcome. Thank you for doing this today. Um, Good morning, Laurie. I've got a few questions to start, and then we will move into a quick discussion about multiple sclerosis, sclerosis and lupus. Uh, but my first question will be, um, this person is about to be vaccinated, but their next dose of ivermectin is due the next day. They're supposed to get the first vaccine and then take ivermectin every two weeks for prevention. And they're wondering if ivermectin will make the vaccine ineffective due to its strong antivirus replication activity. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any uh, existing, you know, uh, uh, protocol in the U.S. that, you know, uh, there are some of the places and some of the hospital trying the ivermectin for the treatment of the COVID patient in the hospital, but it hasn't been, you know, by the FDA approved as a uh, uh, treatment option for the um, a COVID patient at this time. There are uh, so many countries and so, ma uh, so many centers in the world trying to just use the ivermectin for the outpatient as a preventative and as a therapeutic, you know, options for treatment. There's some of the goodest, uh, good result and promising, you know, result as in some of these studies, some of them, they're not supporting it. So we're still in the process preliminary as you know, looking as ivermectin as an alternative preventative me medication or the therapeutic medication for the patient. Uh, for that patient, uh, which uh, uh, the ivermectin is already on board and they're taking it, ivermectin is mechanism is anti-inflammation. Uh, it wouldn't affect the vaccine, they can have their vaccination, uh, but you know, ivermectin is preventing that the COVID not going to the uh, cytokine storm, or the other words, the severe forms of the COVID. So they can have their vaccination. There is no problem, but uh, it can be, there is an, uh, the, the ivermectin is still not as part of the CDC guidelines for the treatment or prevention of the COVID yet. It might be in the future when there is more studies and more support and more evidences you know, coming on the table. Uh, one thing that I want the patients to know, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of publications would be published every day in the world uh, that not supposed to change our uh, practice guidelines and what we're giving to our patient until that um, uh, uh, publication or that you know uh, notion that they're uh, looking at needs to be under the, uh, the study that we call a randomized clinical trial. Randomized clinical trial is uh, these uh, type of studies that they usually just having the two group of the control and the, uh, the, the, the case, which means that they're using the ivermectin versus the group of the people who are not taking it. They're randomizing the patient in two groups based on the pre-existing condition and all the epidemiologic you know, factors to make sure that there is no biases you know, playing you know, in that one and you know, distorting the outcome and give us the wrong information. So by having the randomized clinical trial, we can just you know, clearly see the evidences and that evidence is, is uh, replicable and we can use it for that one. So unfortunately there is not completed you know, evidences from the ivermectin coming, but it's a very promising uh, alternative you know, treatment and preventive um, yeah, uh, options for the patient, which we would know in the future soon. After you know some studies coming, some uh, more randomized clinical trial uh, to be done, and then make it as an evidence without any flaw or the biases for the study. So if someone is already under ivermectin for whatever reason, they can have their vaccination without being worried about it. It's not going to affecting the vaccination. Okay, great. Our next question is uh, from someone who says their mom is a 60 year old and a lupus survivor. She had lupus 15 years ago. She's still taking medication for now for maintenance. Last year she had COVID-19 in the Philippines but she was asymptomatic. Just last month she visited here in the US with the plan to stay until July with her condition while in the US, can she receive a COVID-19 vaccine? 
The answer is yes, we are recommending for everyone who already documented or sus uh, suspiciously got COVID in the past to get the vaccine. Uh, has two benefits. Number one, if you know, sometime, you know, over time, the antibody uh, who is the first uh, layer of the protection against the COVID might just be uh, dropping to the level that might not be functional by having another vaccination, you're uh, stimulating the immune system to protecting and pro uh, providing those uh, uh, antibody. Uh, so we highly recommend uh, uh, the previous guideline from the CDC indicating if someone just got the COVID, wait for three months to let the other people to get the vaccination because they, they're gonna have at least, you know, some protection at least for minimum of the three months, but definitely we want them to also be vaccinated. So yes, the answer is yes, they have to get the vaccination and not to be worried about it and uh, just go from there. Okay, the next question, um, I'm not sure if it's typo, I'll read it as it's written. It may be a typo, typo. if the ANA titter is very high, but lupus has been rolled out. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but lupus has been rolled out. Is the vaccine vaccine safe? So even if the ANA would would have been positive, the uh, vaccine is safe. Okay. Uh, we have to consider and reminding the patient there is a five percent of the lupus patient. Unfortunately, the ANA, which is the first step that we may make, make us you know, suspicious about the lupus might be negative, which is very challenging for the clinician with the negative ANA considering the lupus. But just, uh, we have to keep that in mind that 5% of the real lupus patient, they don't have the positive ANA. But in 95% of the people, their ANA is the first thing would be positive and more confirm, uh, confirmatory uh, a test would be confirming that that is the lupus. So the answer is yes. Okay. The next question is if someone known to have either AIDS or an acquired immune immunity deficiency contracts COVID-19 and manages to clear the infection, if once off exposure makes the patient immune so the vaccine would not be necessary, uh, again, uh, uh, let's just uh, uh, talk a little bit about the, 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 the safety and then how we know that someone has already uh, got the immunity through the vaccination. So the reason that we have two sets of the vaccination in the study, they noticed that if they're giving two sets of the, uh, the vaccine, depends on the protocol, is it Pfizer or Moderna, we have almost 95% efficacy means that if you're checking their uh, antibody in their blood, it shows that it's already been produced. It means that the vaccine was effective, the immune system acknowledged it, responded to it, produced the antibody. So because it's difficult for every single uh, person, you know, uh, for example, in the United States, we cannot just do the vaccination and check every single person to make sure that they're having the antibody. But based on the previous studies uh, and also those uh, 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 before, you know, vaccine coming to the market, they're checking it and they already saw when the people get two sets of the vaccine, 95% of them already have the antibody in their system. So we're assuming that is applicable to the community. So 95% of the people, if they get the vaccination, they're going to have response to us. Uh, response to it uh, through the antibody. We don't need to check the antibody level unless the patient is, you know, like a healthcare worker. And that is very uh, important for us to know that it's been uh, effective. So we can check the antibody for those uh, small subgroup of the people. But for the general population, we don't check to make sure that it's uh, the antibody is there or not. One of the things that is suggesting the antibody must be there if the patient is getting some of the reaction to the, um, the vaccine, that's a good sign. That means that somehow the immune system was involved and produced all those cytokines and the chemical in the body, which the patient is feeling malaise, body ache, and some flu-like symptoms, which is indicating the immune system is already involved. But if we don't have any of those, but just by the statistic, almost 95% of the people after the second dosage they're producing the antibody and they're protected. 
how much that protection and antibody lasts in the body, we still don't know. But again, don't forget, even if the antibody coming to the undetectable level, it's, we, are, we still have some memory cell in our circulating blood you know, stream that is at any point they get the vaccine, the, the real viruses, they can you know, produce the antibody again and defending it. So the lack of the antibody doesn't necessarily mean that we're not immune to the vaccine. Okay. Um, all right, that's the end of those questions. A question I've been hearing a lot lately is, uh, is there a particular vaccine that you recommend for lupus patients or are all of them equally good for the so COVID-19? That's a very difficult question to answer, especially at that point. And because, you know, as we know that this, these current vaccines that has been approved to be used in the United States has been approved under, under the emergency act of the vaccination. That means that we waived some of the uh, pre more precautionary studies that we used to do for developing a vaccine, which it takes you know, years to do that due to the severity and the impact of the vaccine to the community and the world. So they just waived some of those extra uh, precautionary and safety measures that was supposed to be done. So it wasn't, 100% done. So uh, generally speaking, what we know is the Moderna and the Pfizer, uh, based on the initial you know, uh, report has almost 95% efficacy. That means that the 95% of the people receiving this vaccine, they're having some immunity at the end of the second dosage. Uh, there is a 5% of the people, they're not uh, responding to this one, but you know, those are uh, now what we know about the Johnson and Johnson reported, which is a one dose vaccine, uh, is a, has almost 60%, you know, the uh, efficacy, which is lower than Moderna and Pfizer. So if there is an option to get between the Moderna Pfizer versus the Johnson and Johnson, I would recommend to go with the Moderna Pfizer because the efficacy so far shows higher uh, until, you know, more vaccine and the more vaccine is on the way to uh, be produced, which is going to be coming with more studies and everything. But so far in the United States, there are three of them, which is the Moderna, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. If you have, you have the options to get the Moderna and Pfizer, they're superior to the Johnson & Johnson as far as the efficacy. Okay, great. Well, last month was um, Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Month, and we were hoping to to do our talk with you last month, but we're still gonna talk about it. Um, one of the big questions people do have is um, what are, can you have both? Can you have both multiple sclerosis and lupus? Um, because they're both chronic autoimmune diseases, right? So- That is correct. Um, so one of the challenging would be uh, for the clinician is that because as we know the uh, uh, the uh, lupus is a autoimmune disease that involves you know multi organs in the system in the body including the bone and joints including the skin including the central nervous system including the kidney including the heart lungs and other organs and uh, multiple sclerosis is another autoimmune disease that the body attacking the myelin sheath which is the covering, insulating, you know, layers of the nerves that uh, just, you know, destructing the myelin sheet, uh, which is going to be uh, mostly the, uh, the disease with the neurological symptom. Um, there, as we know, both of these diseases are autoimmune, both of these diseases affecting almost the same population, uh, female more than males. They're just having the nature of relapsing and remission, you know, nature, and they can both affecting the nervous system. The challenge comes when the lupus patient presenting with the neurological symptom and they do the MRI, which they usually do, and then they see some lesions in the brain or spinal cord, and their question is, are we dealing with lupus or are we dealing with the um, um, multiple sclerosis? That sometimes is very challenging because by the nature of the lesion on the imaging, we cannot differentiate between these two 
Yeah, there's some of things that the clinician, it, it would help the clinician to just differentiate between these two. One is we're not expecting the multiple sclerosis, you know, affecting the joints or affecting the, uh, the causing skin rashes, causing other symptoms that usually they do, don't do. So uh, multiple sclerosis is uh, exclusively affecting the central nervous system. And lupus is uh, the opposite. Lupus could just, you know, involve any organs. So if you have other organ involvements, the diagnosis would be in the more favor of the lupus. Also ANA. So anytime that we have a central nervous lesion, they already did the MRI. They're saying we cannot tell, is it a, you know, definitely a lupus or is it a definitely a multiple sclerosis? The clinician needs to, if it's a neurologist seeing you know, the patient, they have to refer them to the rheumatologist or asking with the primary physician to do more testing like ANA. And if the ANA is positive, most likely we are dealing with the lupus that is manifesting as a neurological symptom and involvement of the neurological symptom. So it's more in the favor of the uh, lupus. And if, you know, uh, so that would be very helpful. Also, sometimes, you know, we see a lesion, patient doesn't have the ANA positive. The other things that we can do is analysis of the, cent uh, the, the uh, lumbar puncture, the CSF, which is the fluid uh, surrounding around the central nervous system and the spinal cord. Uh, there's some of the uh, oligoclonal bands that they can find, which is the, the characteristic of the multiple sclerosis. So the bottom line answering this question is, although there is a lot of similarities when the loop is affecting the central nervous system, there are still a lot of ways that we can differentiate between these two. Uh, and there is a 20 cases already been reported that the patient had both the diagnosis of the lupus and multiple sclerosis. So it's not impossible that the patient has both disease, but it's, the chances is very slim that someone has both disease. It's possible, but the chances is very slim. But okay. when it comes to the challenges for the diagnosis, the clinician can just do some tests uh, like the ANA, like the analysis, the CSF, and also looking at if there is any other organ involved. If other organs involved because besides the CNS, then it's more in the favor of the lupus. And if the ANA is positive, we're assuming this is lupus until proven otherwise. But okay. still 20 cases been reported in the world that the patient got both of them, multiple okay. sclerosis and lupus uh, together, but that's a rare presentation. Very low percentage, yeah. Yeah. Um, so do rheumatologists treat MS? No, actually it would be a multidisciplinary, uh, but multidisciplinary uh, group that they need to treat. So rheumatologists taking care of the lupus part and the uh, uh, neurologist uh, expert in the multiple sclerosis, treating the multiple sclerosis part. And of course they have to be working together and communicate with each other to make sure that they know what they're doing and the plan is being reconciled or something that the patient get benefit uh, out of the treatment. Okay, um, and this is just a more general question about autoimmune diseases. Is, is there a family connection between autoimmune diseases? There are a lot of autoimmune diseases has been shown that is higher when the family is being involved. We're learning more and more about the, the genes uh, that are responsible to make someone having or uh, acquire, uh, g g presenting with the autoimmune disease. We still don't know all of the genetic predisposition for all the diseases, but of course, if <clears throat> there is a family history of the autoimmune disease, the chances is much higher in the offspring, uh, but we still don't know all the genetic you know, part of it. Some of those genes are already being recognized, and in the future, what we could do is not a clinical testing and a blood test. It's gonna be genetic, uh, genetic testing to just uh, find those genes and say, you have these genes, you have this presentation, so you have that disease. But we don't know all of the genes responsible for all the autoimmune disease. One of the things is we have, we, should, we shouldn't forget is the number of the studies that we do is based on the budget that we have for um, any single disease. The rarer the disease, the less budget is allocated for that study right. for being done in that area. So for the diabetes, we have millions of the 
patients are affecting and a lot of uh, budgets and grants are allocated for doing the study in those areas. So we have more information, we have more randomized clinical trial, which is helping us to just know more about them. Unfortunately, when the disease becoming more rare, they're less budgeting for doing the study on those group. So most of the uh, publication and a study that we have are anecdotal or sporadic here and there based on the budget or uh, the, the fundraising that was done for that type of you know, disease that would help to just do more studies. Uh, but in the future, of course, we're gonna know more about it. Uh, Jay and his group uh, has been helping and asking for the Congress to just allocating more uh, budgeting for research on the lupus which we saw the great result of the two medication came to the market and working for the lupus nephritis, which we have to thank the group and everyone for all the efforts and time they put to just make this happen. So hopefully in the future, okay. uh, we're gonna know more about it and uh, more genetic testing is coming. And in the future of the medicine, uh, all these you know, the clinical testing that we do is very obsolete because we can do with the genetic testing, a lot of disease would be revealed. But since we don't know all the mapping and database for all the genes involving for the disease, we're still not there yet, but we will. That's great, yeah. I think that's most of our questions that we have today. Is there anything else you'd like to comment on or? So I'm so glad, you know, compared to the previous uh, uh, webinar that we had in the past that we were not sure, you know, how soon we're gonna get the vaccine and then, you know, not having all those surge in the number of the mortalities and morbidities with the COVID. So numbers are coming down, we're so happy. Of course, we have to always make sure there are always some surge, you know, a small one is gonna happen, but once the general population would be more immune to it and more knowledge is gonna be spread among the population, we're gonna be safer. And of course, there would be more treatment is coming to the, coming on board. So uh, I'm so glad that, you know, we're just getting there. More population is being vaccinated. So uh, COVID is, uh, we're at a better stage of dealing with the COVID as far as the treatment, as far as the diagnosis, as far as, you know, knowing, you know, like the risk for the patient and everything. And we are more, much better positioned at this time compared to uh, last year that we were talking about this. Definitely. And we're looking forward to have better numbers and coming back to the normalcy soon, hopefully. So yeah. we're past this nightmare. I hope so, yes. yes. Well, thank you so much for your time again today, Dr. Parsa. My and pleasure. we will chat with you again next month. That would be my pleasure. And I look forward to talk to you. And uh, if the patient has any question, please just send it to Lori and the uh, Lupus Foundation of the Northern California and we'll uh, look at those uh, questions and we'll have another chat soon. That's right. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Parsa. Have a great yeah, day. Bye-bye.